one thirty. So we will start today's T and E committee meeting. Uh, before we begin, I want to remind the committee members and members of the public to follow our code of conduct at meetings. This includes commenting on the specific agenda item only and addressing the full body. Uh, public, public speakers, speakers will not engage, engage in a conversation with members of the committee directly. All members of the committee, staff, and the public are expected to refrain from abusive language, failure to comply with the code of conduct, which will disturb, disrupt, or impede the orderly conduct of this meeting will result in removal from the meeting. So let's start with roll call. Gundelas? Present. Ortiz? Present. Foley? Here. Davis? Here. And Cohen? Here. Thank you. All right, so we start with a um, work plan review. Um, we just need to add the item that's uh, number five on the agenda to this agenda, so I'll entertain a motion to amend the work plan. I'll move. Second. All right, I guess we have a public speaker on this one. Yes, so if you can make your way down to the podium, you will be given two minutes to speak and please state your name. Thank you. We have two public speaker cards. Hi, thank you, Blair Beekman. Um, you know, I'm learning that there's gonna be, this item is gonna be on the further down the agenda. Um, I just wanted to uh, Thank yourself, Blair Beekman here. I just wanted to thank yourselves that this item uh, is here. Uh, I was curious is if there is going to actually be continue to be a, a smart cities committee that this item is usually a part of. And um, I haven't seen the smart cities committee around. And uh, so is a smart cities committee going to be placed into other committee uh, planning? And, uh, and I guess I'll talk more about this item uh, when it comes up today. Thank you. We have another speaker card for Lillian. I would say that my comments are the same as Mr. Beekman's. I did listen to a climate um, smart city um, uh, meeting recently and I do believe that the Clean Energy Committee and those committees are going to be combined in some way. They really didn't discuss carbon neutrality or the governor's new plan on uh, carbon neutrality. Um, and I'm very interested in hearing what you have to say about that today. Thank you. All right, thank you. And as uh, Blair noticed, the Smart Cities Committee has been discontinued and all the items on the Smart Cities Committee are being distributed into the other committees where they are appropriate. Uh, so let's take a vote on the um, work plan. We can vote electronically. Everyone's present. All right, motion carries 5-0. So that brings us, we have no consent today, will brings us to our first item, uh, wastewater discharge regulation and potential impacts on San Jose. Uh, we will start, uh, I see who's presenting today. I gotta get my notes. Thank you, Kip. It's Jennifer Vicola Brown. I'll start kick us off. Thank you. Well, if that's teeing up, I might as well uh, start off by introducing myself. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Cohen and members of the committee. I'm Jennifer Vicola Brown. I'm the Sustainability and Compliance Division Manager for the Environmental Services Department. Uh, I'm joined today by some of our brilliant team members, uh, Eric Dunlavy, the Environmental Programs Manager over Wastewater Compliance, and Jason Nettleton, Principal Engineer over Air Compliance at the Regional Wastewater Facility. Our presentation. Well, this is our annual update to inform the committee about our regulatory activities and changes that might affect the facility. Um, as part of this, we're also gonna share activities that we engage in to maintain compliance and prepare for regulations, which in the end results in enhanced benefits to the environment and habitats through our stewardship.
I'll just keep on in the meantime. Um, when the slides come up, uh, you could go to the second slide, please. There you go. Oh, is it a clicker? Oh, great. Um, as the largest advanced treatment facility in the West, we serve millions of people across several cities. As such, it's subject to many regulations and holds multiple permits that keep us um, aiming for high standards to protect the environment. To ensure compliance and to be proactive, we remain vigilant and actively engaged in regional coalitions to track any upcoming legislation or regulations that could impact operations. Within these regional partnerships, we collaborate on various studies that monitor water quality in Habitat of the Bay. This ultimately helps us to understand how our activities, our, the big our people as a whole, may or may not affect the ecosystem and prepares our agency with science-based evaluations that inform operations and decisions made in the capital improvement program. So this is the regional wastewater facility's vast service area. It covers about half of Santa Clara County where it provides nonstop service. The information we gain from our regional partnerships and how we strive for co collaborative relationships with our regulators allows us to advocate on behalf of the community and businesses in our service area and across our tributary agencies. Um, and it also helps us to advocate um, on behalf of the facility for sensible regulations. While this update is focused on regulatory details, we don't want to lose sight that all of this furthers Environmental Service Department's mission to deliver world-class utility services and programs to improve our health, environment, and the economy. Next, we'll discuss the permits and regulatory activities, starting with wastewater. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. So um, the RWF wastewater discharges are regulated by three main wastewater permits. There is our individual permit, which will be reissued in 2025. There's also our nutrient permit, which addresses nitrogen and phosphorus, and these are two elements that occur in all wastewater, and they're essential for a healthy bay, but they can have detrimental effects if they occur at high levels and under the right conditions. I'll be providing more detail about nutrient regulations in just a moment. And finally, there's the PCBs and mercury permit, which establishes effluent limits for these legacy pollutants and describes other requirements to control and reduce PCBs and mercury. So our nutrient permit requires financial support for a regional science program to evaluate the impact of nutrients on the environmental health of San Francisco Bay. We've actively engaged in leadership positions in this science program for the past 11 years. It's a highly collaborative process with scientists, regulators, dischargers, and environmental groups studying the nutrient issues in the Bay, and it's received national awards for collaborative regulatory development. Now, previously, there were no clear signs of ecological impairment of the Bay, and this was despite very elevated levels of nutrients in Bay waters. This all changed in August 2022, when a massive bloom of a toxic red tide algae known as Heterosigma akashiwo spread from the Alameda Inner Harbor throughout the Bay for several weeks. The bloom, fueled by high nitrogen levels from wastewater discharges, killed, uh, caused fish kills uh, throughout most of the Bay. And this event was really a game changer that altered the trajectory of the development of nutrient regulations. Our nutrient permit will contain a nitrogen limit when it is reissued next year, and it will also require further reductions of nitrogen discharges from wastewater agencies over the next 10 years. The full extent of those nitrogen reductions is still under evaluation, but agencies that do not currently reduce nitrogen in their waste streams will be required to achieve the largest reductions. The RWF is already very effective at removing nutrients from wastewater due to past upgrades and very recent optimizations, and this really sets us apart from the other wastewater treatment plants in the region. To ensure we can meet future nitrogen limits in the long term, the RWF completed a study in 2021 that evaluated the upgrades necessary to meet nitrogen regulations well into the future. The upgrade technology has been identified and the timing and implementation are currently being finalized. Wastewater compliance staff have also proactively monitored the environmental condition in the Lower South Bay as shown in the picture on the right. This monitoring conducted year round confirmed that the Lower South Bay was spared from the most severe impacts of the August 2022 red tide bloom. And while water quality in the Lower South Bay was lessened during the bloom, there were no fish kills in this part of the bay, and fish monitoring actually indicated a healthy fish community even at the height of the bloom. 
The permit also requires a regional evaluation of the opportunities and costs to reduce nutrient loads to the bay through expanded recycled water and through utilizing nature-based solutions that beneficially reuse treated wastewater for habitat creation or enhancements. These evaluations of cost and opportunity of non-traditional nutrient reduction strategies will add useful information to our existing understanding of the costs of traditional engineered treatment technologies. So shifting from nutrients to CECs, there are an enormous number of CECs or contaminants of emerging concern, and the number of these compounds that are occurring at elevated levels in the bay grows each year. Presently, there are no regulatory limits for CECs, but these contaminants should be evaluated very carefully in wastewater and in the bay in order to determine if pollutant reduction strategies or regulations are necessary. ESD's Pollution Prevention Program takes a proactive approach to CECs by assessing environmental risk, then taking action to reduce that risk through outreach, education, and legislative advocacy. And this is so future regulations do not result in even more expensive treatment systems or programs uh, to fix a problem that could have been avoided. Uh, we accomplish this through a collaborative science-based process, and with our partners, we conduct special studies to build our knowledge and evaluate CEC environmental sources and transport that then inform pollution prevention messaging. And our outreach messaging on flea and tick treatments for pets and safe medicine disposal are great examples of how this collaborative science-based process has informed effective public outreach campaigns. And the, the proactive approach has worked very well to address CEC's issues early and avoid costly regulations, but it's no guarantee that future CEC regulations will be avoided. In some cases, they may be inevitable. That's the likely case for PFAS, which is a current CEC that has increased national attention. These are forever chemicals used in a broad range of products from food packaging to firefighting foams. And we've been proactive by partnering with regional collaborators to conduct a baywide study evaluating levels of PFAS entering and leaving wastewater treatment plants, as well as looking at the most significant sources of PFAS discharged into the collection system. This is a unique study in the Bay Area that has the support of our state regulators and EPA. The study's wrapping up and results will be critical in determining the actions that will effectively reduce PFAS levels in wastewater, and it will enable us to respond to any future wastewater regulations for PFAS. Um, that's it from me. I'm going to turn it over now to Jason Nettleton, who will update you on air. Thank you. Uh, air pollution emissions are regulated by the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, or just Air District, through the federal operating permit, the Title V, and the local permit to operate. These permits list all applicable air emission-related limits and requirements. The Air District is in the process of developing and implementing rules aimed at addressing climate change and environmental justice concerns, including the three listed on this slide that will apply to the RWF. The regulatory process can move slowly, so these are the same regulations that we've been tracking for the last few years. Uh, the RWF is not expected to see direct effects from any of these regulations for at least another year or more. Uh, the proposed uh, Regulation 13.4 has the greatest potential to affect the RWF in the future. Development of the rule has been on hold for the last two years, but may restart by the end of this year. Uh, the Bay Area Clean Water Association and city staff will work with the Air District during the rule development to create a rule to reduce greenhouse gas emissions without compromising our ability to meet nutrient reduction goals. Uh, the Air District commissioned a study of odors in Milpitas with a focus on the Newby Island Landfill, Zero Waste Energy Facility, and the RWF. The draft report issued in 2022 identified odors from all three facilities in Milpitas, but pointed to the landfill as the cause of the majority of the odor complaints. The Air District uh, management has indicated that they intend to use a rulemaking process to address the findings of the odor study, um, but that uh, process will not kick off until after the report has been finalized. Uh, city staff will work with the Air District during that rulemaking process. That's all for the air. So uh, wrapping up, as uh, we've seen firsthand this year, issues can change quickly, so it's 
really important for us to continue the studies so we have data on hand already to inform decisions when priorities shift unexpectedly. That will also um, uh, reinforce why we need to stay flexible and agile in our capital program so that projects have a pathway in which they can evolve and respond to future regulation. We're gonna continue uh, engaging with our regulators. As we've seen in the situation with the uh, nutrient permit, our effective working relationship uh, regionally and with our regulators has allowed us to stand out and be recognized for our efforts um, in reducing nutrients early on. And for um, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, even though we haven't seen much change yet, we could tell that our regional approach to our message to their leadership about our concerns with the process of implementing air quality regulations is being heard. Our strategy is working, so we're going to keep being proactive and not lose sight of the importance of our work that benefits the environment and keeps the public safe in a fiscal, fiscally responsible manner. And with that, we're available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. It's interesting uh, information about the updates and what it is that we need to do to be compliant. Um, so I'll ask some questions later, but first we have comments from the public. We have one speaker card. Blair Beekman, please make your way down to the podium. You will have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Hi, Blair Beekman. Um, I guess uh, about this item to first note that uh, the VTA uh, board of directors at their, you know, most recent uh, board of directors public meeting each month uh, on their consent calendar items, they approved a, a report about uh, how the dredging of the BART tunnel issues in the downtown area, that, that dredging material is gonna be placed in, in the bay, uh, in the South Bay. Uh, it'll be interesting to note how that dredging will relate to uh, what you're talking about on this item at this time. I'm hopeful and optimistic what it can say and what it can be about, and just a reminder for yourselves uh, uh, how to connect things and work on items, and, and that it can be uh, an understandable process for all of us, for those that it's a little more difficult to connect such things. Good luck in making it clear and understandable uh, what we're working on. Uh, I also wanted to mention, uh, you're talking a lot about these sort of uh, water pollution issues as of late. Uh, you've received some really hefty, important federal funding dollars for this project, as many cities in the Bay Area and even where I'm from now in San Diego are also receiving these federal funding dollars for uh, sewer water and stormwater cleanup things. Uh, the Tijuana area uh, has a, a sewer system that spills out into the ocean there and goes up into San Diego, and uh, that's gonna be a serious issue to address. You're trying to work with federal agencies here to address issues, so thank you for that work. Uh, it's an important reminder that in all this new federal funding dollars, I hope we don't overemphasize law enforcement, and a thank you that uh, places like the housing department are trying to work with the people who live along the creeks to uh, find them homes, and good luck in the continued effort, thank you. Back to the committee. All right, are there any questions from anyone? Doesn't look like it. I'll just ask a quick question. So the nitrogen reduction, do we, do we have any idea about how much lower it'll be than what's currently required? Um, there are not current uh, requirements, load requirements. We were expecting a load cap when uh, this permit was coming up for reissuance. We will get a load cap, which is going to essentially keep us at our current performance. And then there, there are going to be load reductions. Those discussions with our regulators are still sort of being fleshed out in terms of timing and um, how quickly agencies can move. Our agency in particular, since we've already substantially reduced our nitrogen load, we achieve about an 85% reduction from the head of the plant to the end of the plant, which really sets us apart from everybody else. So our expectation is that we will have to maintain that, which will still be a challenge as population grows. So we still have to maintain the load that's leaving the RWF even with increased levels of nitrogen coming in. And that's what our, that's what our um, plans are to do now. So other treatment plants who don't already do this will have a lot of work to do to get up to. That's load. correct, yes. Especially the large ones. Yeah. 
Good. Um, if, we, if as we begin to divert more, presumably of of our effluent for purification or you know to recycle, um, does that have an effect on the discharge? I mean, I, presumably everything's very uniform, depending no matter how much the volume is. Is that true, or do we? If you have less, does that lead to more issues? Um, so diversions help if the uh, water that's diverted has those nutrients that would have otherwise gone into the bay. When you're talking about purified water, oftentimes you're talking about a reverse osmosis system that sends the concentrated load of nitrogen right out into the bay. So it doesn't, it doesn't actually provide uh, a reduction in the load. If you're, if you're talking about non-purified diversions, that does. Yeah, that's what I was wondering about. It, it, as you pur pur pull some off and purify, does that make it harder to meet the, uh, the objectives? It, it poses some additional challenges, yes. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Is there a motion to accept the report? Move to accept the report. Second. All right, let's vote. All right, the motion carries 5-0. So item two is our community forest management plan uh, update. Uh, John is gonna kick us off. Thank you, Chair and Committee. John Russo, Director of Transportation. Just let me introduce the people that will be doing the presentation. Rick Scott from Department of Transportation's Deputy Director, Sarah Davis, our new city forester, and John Tu, Division Manager, Planning, Building, Code Enforcement. This is an update of where we are with the Community Forest Management Plan, and I think we've got a lot of work that we did, and we'd like to present that to the committee, and I'm gonna turn it over to Rick right now. Thanks, John. Good afternoon, members of the committee, members of the public. Uh, my name is Rick Scott, Deputy Director of DOT. For those of you who may not have been here, or just as a reminder for those of you that were, the Community Forest Management Plan was adopted on February 8th, 2022. Um, we applied DOT, the city applied for a grant, and uh, basically got a, a analysis of where we stand as an urban forestry program. Uh, third party analysis of the entire program from start to finish, including development review, planting, mitigation fees, all those things. The development of a strategic work plan based on the recommendations derived from that initial analysis and then an updated tree policy best management practices manual um, again the the plan was adopted on february 8th 2022 with some council supplemental memos one of which we'll also be discussing today uh, called for an audit on tree planting development review and the mitigation fees so that's going to be a, a basically the second half of the report here um, it resulted in the formation of the Community Forest Advisory Committee, which it was uh, recommended in the plan and also a supplemental memo, and uh, CAL FIRE provided that quote at the end there. There were some pretty key findings that have guided our work in this first year. Uh, the first one is that tree canopy cover declined from 15.3% to 13.2% from 2012 and 2020. The initial report uh, went through 2018, and I'm going to explain why we have 2020 here in a minute. Um, unsurprisingly, economically disadvantaged communities also have fewer trees, and as a result, increased vulnerability to environmental and health impacts. So we are gonna show some ways in which we've been able to disaggregate the data and hopefully uh, start making an impact there. City staffing and maintenance is underfunded and very low compared to equivalent cities. And fortunately, again, in the FY22-23 budget, we had significant uh, enhancements to our program for the first time in a long time, and I think have made some pretty significant progress. Um, there are a few more recommendations there. I just want to again point to the uh, inventory for public space and street trees is needed. We have an inventory from 2014, but as you can imagine, that is now outdated. So we're going to need to update it. We've been updating it here and there, but we're going to need to take some uh, substantial action to make sure we update the whole thing at once. Uh, it might be hard to see it's a little washed out here, uh, but we've got a couple of maps that reflect the updated data. So the report went through 2018. Um, we had our staff look at 2020, and then there was also redistricting that occurred uh, in 2022. So we uh, show to the figure one, we show the updated council districts uh, and the canopy cover there. Again, it, it, the green is basically 15% or over. It's kind of hard to see. Um, and then we've kind of been experimenting with new ways to visualize the data to the right there. It's canopy covered by census block, which is the smallest uh, basically unit of measurement for the federal census. So you can see it's interesting when you look at what it looks like by district. When you look at what it looks like by census block, you can learn a lot more from that level of detail. Uh, and when you overlay what we've done here, as you can see the orange outlines, we've overlaid a commonly used 
uh, layer to show equity in DOT programs, the equity priority communities, as outlined by the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. So you can see uh, finding two from the previous slide is, is pretty much validated by this. We need to make sure that we're focusing on planting trees with an equity lens in areas that uh, have historically not had adequate tree canopy coverage. Uh, and then the work plan roadmap. So this, this was actually a slide we, we lifted directly from um, the 2022 uh, acceptance of the report of the, of the plan. So to the left there are all of the strategies outlined in the strategic work plan. Um, they've guided our work really for this last year and a half since the adoption. To the right there, you can see the objectives. And I'm not gonna read each one, um, but the light blue ones were essentially areas that we focused our first couple of years of effort on. Um, if you look at this and the audit, and audit, the audit is attachment B of the memo, the uh, report or the strategic work plan is attachment A, you can see that a lot, there is a lot of overlap between the audit recommendations, the work that we've accomplished and kind of our strategies and our, our priorities in the immediate years to come. So I just wanna, um, before I hand it over to our new city forester, uh, city forester program manager, Sarah Davis, I also wanna highlight that the staff, while they were dealing, while they were trying to make progress on all of these fronts, uh, responded to the largest storm anyone can remember in January. It was the same, the same staff, so we've got a couple members of the forestry team in the audience. And I just wanna acknowledge the work that they did on that front in addition to all of the large strategic differences that, that the team has made in this first year. Actually, really the first six months since we've had a team. So um, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah Davis. Hi, thank you for having me today. Um, I, I wanna highlight some of the accomplishments that the team has made so far. I wish I could take credit for them, but I can't. I've only been here for three months. Um, so first off, we added to the staff. So we have a, a small but mighty uh, emerging forestry division. Um, we are on track to plant 2,000 uh, trees this year, which is more than previous years. We did form that community uh, advisory council and met with them in January and have an upcoming meeting being scheduled in July. Um, our colleagues at uh, Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement were able to uh, implement new citywide design guidelines that add um, a significant amount of weight around planting trees correctly, as well as maintaining the amount of canopy cover that we have. Um, and parks uh, did an inventory on their assets and are able to manage those better now. So we still need some things to get us where we wanna go, um, and that is providing support to planning, building, and code enforcement, which, which we're doing in terms of the plan review projects right now. Um, we are working on doing a complete street tree inventory, so um, submitted for some federal grants to see if we can't get that, that money in to pay for that. Um, and we're gonna update our core metrics so we can come back with an annual report every year to, to say, this is the work that we accomplished, that sort of thing. Um, as well as um, we need a public education campaign and a strategy. Tree care in San Jose is a little bit unique and we need to change some of the community's practices. Um, so Cal Fire has stepped forward to fund that campaign. So that's exciting. Next, um, we're looking at the audit recommendations um, to guide our community forest management plan. Uh, you, you heard that audit um, last year, so we're trying to make progress with that audit findings. Um, so we have a graphic of how the money that gets paid into planning for in lieu of planting trees, a flow chart there. Um, so you can see that was a significant part of the audit. So I'll turn it over to John to take the next part. Oh, I'm sorry, not yet, not yet. Oh, I was one ahead of myself. Um, so you can see here in this graph, the amount of money that that in lieu fee of, in lieu fee, um, builds up over time. And part of the problem we have is we can't really forecast very well when that money is gonna come in. So we may review a plan that establishes a, a certain dollar amount, We great, approved it, but that project might not get built for, say, another three to five years. And it isn't until those building permits are issued then that, that 
that fee is paid. So, so it's, it can be kind of unpredictable and it looks like we're not spending money, but I assure you that we definitely are. It's just the fund keeps filling right back up. Alrighty, so where is all that money going, right? So we have spent so far in this fiscal year a little over half a million dollars in planting trees and as well as holding reserve to, for the establishment of those trees for the next three years. So making sure that they get watered and they'll be successful. We changed some of the process a little bit now. We've moved the, the where the fee goes from planning over into DOT, so we don't have to do as much paperwork and moving the money around, which saves a lot of time. And we're working on um, how we distribute those funds. Uh, we heard loud and clear that we want 50% of the funds that are generated in the council district to stay there, and the balance of the other 50% could be distributed equitably around town. So, still to come, we have, uh, we're increasing the number of nonprofit partners we work with to gain traction into more communities. And um, we're looking into all kinds of new technologies around how we build streets, sidewalks, roads, um, in ways that can keep our trees alive longer. Uh, if now you, I'll return it over to you, Jeff. Actually, if you could just one back, there was one little piece I think you, you skipped over I'd like to make sure is really clear. Uh, 1,861 trees. That's the part that I'd like to just put in there that, that, that we want to make sure we don't lose that. Ad and we're oh, well on track to 2,000. Rick, looks like you might even have some new data. 1944 as of Monday. 1944 as of Monday. Thank you. All right. Uh, that's a, a lot more than we thought the team could do than the team thought they could do. So I just want to make sure that was really clear. Thank you. You. Good afternoon, John Tu, Division Manager from Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. I'd like to provide you an update on the planning role in the tree removal and placement audit. PBCE oversees the approval and planning of tree replacement for trees proposed for removal or planting on private property. <clears throat> As Rick's covered in his previous slides, PBC has multiple permit types depending on the types of property. Whether their tree qualifies as dead, unsuitable, or live tree, the city ordinance defines an ordinance sized tree as a tree more than 38 inches in circumference measured four and a half feet above the ground. We generally require discretionary permits for those trees unless those trees are dead or unsuitable, which then may be removed with an administrative permit. The audit recommended improvements for tracking and follow-up on trees that were slated as replacements for trees removed on site. What the audit found was a lack of training and expertise in the assessment of the trees in the planning department, and this led to inconsistencies in the evaluation of trees proposed for removal. PVC has started to address these issues by working with DOT City Arbor's team to provide early referral to them and incorporate them as part of the permit routing system. Additionally, our permitting system now includes an information field to track the number of trees to be removed and the required replacements on site. This includes both a way to submit proof of planting and verification from staff and the ability to run reports to use as follow-up and potentially hold up any future permits until the replacement trees are resolved. With these modifications, staff has developed internal procedures to ensure a more uniform application of the process to provide a more consistent evaluation of these applications. In cooperation with DOT, we're working to create a draft of new tree replacement policy and conducting outreach, as well as examine the fee schedule to ensure permit fees are both fair to applicants and to the extent possible cost recovery for the work required for the evaluation of these tree applications and verification. Planning would like to acknowledge that the development of new tree policies would not be an easy task as it has to balance both our general plan policies that encourages denser developments and avoids the edge of the city. The spaces in these urban de developments have a lot of completing interests such as active open space, landscaping and stormwater treatment. Our goal is to develop a policy that makes applicants think critically and creativity about how to meet all these goals while preserving our existing tree canopy. Pass on to the next slide. So what are we going to do moving forward? So this year we'll hit that 2,000 new trees planted mark. We're going to update a portion of our street tree inventory. And we're looking for funding 
to uh, maintain our urban forest. We did submit an Inflation Reduction Act a grant application to the U.S. Forest Service for about $8.6 million, so hopefully we'll hear how that turns out. Um, we do have our new maintenance contract for tree services. Um, that's about ready to go out to bid on the street. Um, and we're going to work on drafting a tree replacement policy, so there'll be fewer questions. Also, our uh, advisory committee is going to be working on some outreach strategies. So that group will help influence how we go forward with our education campaign from CAL FIRE. That's coming in around about 250,000, so we're super excited for that. Um, additionally, San Jose is going to lead the charge on that public information campaign that will be scaled up for the rest of the state. And then um, we're going to keep working on all of the items in the audit. And so we're really looking forward to the future and um, how we can build out this program and provide more environmental justice to the community. Um, and we're open for questions. All right, thank you very much for the report. Let's start with public comment. We have one speaker card, Blair Beekman. Please make your way down to the podium. You will have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Oh, is my mic? Yeah, there it is. Hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, I'm going to try for some first tough words here at first, uh, and then go into a more regular understanding of things. Um, I think uh, we've been working really hard. Blair Beekman here. Uh, I think we've been working really hard um, in the past few years to understand uh, uh, potential uh, natural disasters here in the Bay Area. And I think we've done some interesting work. We've done some good work. And in that good work in preparing for some natural disasters, we're also asking, uh, can we actually mitigate uh, natural disasters happening sooner and put them off till later? And so I think we're doing that. I personally feel we're accomplishing that. I used to fear very much we're going to have major worries at the end of this year uh, about earthquake issues. I feel a bit more comfortable about that now that uh, that's not going to happen. That's not the case. I'm not positive, but I'm hopeful. Um, when you're talking about funding items for this, uh, it, it, it reminds me uh, this has been a years-long process, and what I understood at the time is why you're not specifically, it's not being better funded, is because they're trying to, part of the negotiation process is to understand what to expect of our natural disasters in the next few years, and uh, how to work uh, with that and around it. And uh, just a thank you so much that you're working on this issue, and that hopefully you can get the funding and we can build trees. Uh, it's my personal feeling east side of San Jose uh, has, a, has a different history than the west side of San Jose in terms of its Bay Area marsh uh, conditions. Um, but I know Magdalena Carrasco has done some really interesting work as well on tree issues. And that uh, uh, you worked a lot with Cal OES, who should have lots of ideas about preparedness practices overall. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Back to the committee. Thank you. Councilmember Ortiz. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude for the staff uh, and, of course, all of your efforts in creating the report and making progress towards the goals outlined in the Community Forest Management Plan. Your efforts are truly appreciated. I wanted to just flag for staff and, and constituents that based on the 2020 uh, calculations, cur uh, currently District 5 has the smallest percentage of canopy coverage. Um, and in, Previously, uh, our canopy coverage was at 12.64% um, among, which was among the, the five lowest uh, with canopies here, five lowest districts with canopies here. Um, but unfortunately, in the most recent statistic, uh, our canopy has reduced to 10.05%, which is very troubling for me and, and of course my uh, constituents. Um, knowing that, you know, this is the reality, I look forward to collaborating with staff and, you know, known nonprofits that work in this field to come up with creative solutions that will begin to address both the lack of canopy and health-related issues that may arise due to the, the lack of, of canopy. Um, but 
something that I saw in the statistics is um, multiple districts within the city of San, San Jose's canopies are starting to uh, reduce. So we should be keeping that in mind as we are allocating and, and making strategies towards um, the overall strategy. I just think, you know, uh, the canopies are extremely important, especially as we're going into the summer. You know, they have the tendency to reduce uh, temperatures and um, overall, I believe, city time and staff time spent on uh, reducing uh, uh, forestry and uh, well, increasing forestry and increasing um, tree canopy is, is, is a good use of staff time. So I look forward to working with you and any nonprofits or any community leaders to, um, you know, begin to improve the results for my district. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Davis. Thank you. Um, first of all, I wanna thank you for the report and uh, just, I just wanna give kudos. I think you guys have made a ton of progress just in a very short time and are taking the recommendations from the audit very seriously and I really appreciate it. Almost 2,000 trees already and that's since the, since the audit, is that right? I would say mostly it's this fiscal year, but okay. mostly since the audit, it's just aligned with the season. Because we didn't have great tracking system before that, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm. I'm just. I'm excited for the progress that you've already made, and and for the progress to come. Thanks. Yeah, I want to thank you also for the progress. I mean, it's it's quite a change in terms of what we're doing since we had the conversation back in January, um, and it's nice it's nice to see. Um, I, I do have a question a little bit about the methodology on your tree canopy cover data. It, it, has the methodology changed in addition to some of the geography changing? I'll take that one. So canopy cover is typically done through remote sensing. Um, so technology is progressing. So when we look at the imaging, you know, a, tree, a pixel used to be really big now, you know, larger than a meter. Now our pixel size can get down to about six inches. So the canopy appears bigger in previous years and it's smaller but more accurate in current years. So the methodology has changed um, and you'll see that trend across the nation as the analysis is able to get better. It looks like everyone's canopy is going down. So. Yeah, so I'll, ju I'll just add okay. that, you know, anytime you're working with data, it's about finding the source of truth and kind of trying to stick to it so that you've got a consistent basis for comparison. And I think, you know, to, to maybe kind of build on what Sarah was saying, like, we're, we haven't changed the methodology from 2018 to 2020. And I think if in future reports, if that changes or we use a different source of truth, that'll be annotated so that just like with our pavement program, you know, we, we redid something, we'll make sure that that's marked so that it's an apples to apples comparison or as close as can be. So the last time we looked at this data, we didn't have the 2020 numbers on it, right? We only had yeah, it to 2018, right. so that's why things are looking different. But unfortunately, there's still- That plus the redistricting. Yeah, the redistricting changed, changed a little bit. Yeah. I, I'm kind of curious, not, not that I want District 4 to remain the lowest tree canopy, but I had remembered and that the District 4 had been the lowest, and I, I understood that D5 was close. Um, I'm just, I, this, this kind of surprised me to see it change that much, not that I, you know, have any way of telling who has more trees. Um, and I'm just kind of curious as to how, you know, what led to that. I'm obviously, you know, there are different areas of land that moved and we had, we had a golf course that's no longer there and maybe just the golf course itself, you know, had a lot of open space that no longer, that took lower tree canopy out and therefore changed the number, but I'm just, or, or, you know, I could say that my tree initiative actually worked and I was worst and now we're fifth worst that's and it's it. all just because that D4 is tree initiative. That's so that's what I'll, that's probably what I'll say. Um, <laughs> but anyway, no, I, 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 I appreciate all the work you're doing. It's making progress. It looks great, although the numbers are still declining and obviously that could be methodology. It's, we know it's because of tree disease and other things that are happening and, and, and development and other things that kind of are bigger than, than the tree pro program, but thank you for the work you're doing. And I, now I pledge to, um, to, you know, maybe share some of my uh, tree resources with District 5 so we can help them get, you know, jump up the next time we see the report. Yeah, I heard it, folks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I do have one question on, uh, <laughs> on um, the uh, tree replacement policy. I, you know, since the last, since we had this discussion in January, we had a conversation with an HOA 
in a, an apartment complex, and they seem to be treated the same way as, like, as, an, as a um, development parcel, where if they take out a tree, you have to replace it with three to five trees. But yet, if they have a tree that's an inappropriate type of tree and it's causing a big mess and they want to replace it, they don't have room to put in three trees in its replacement, but, but the policy says they have to, which means they don't do the work. And so I'm wondering if we want, if we, I don't know if somebody has a comment on that or, and what we might do when it comes to that policy for different types of properties. So the city does treat single family versus multifamily a little differently. The idea is that when the multifamily came forward, it was a master plan and included a landscaping plan. Whereas a single family, it could have just been incidentally planted or just happened haphazardly so that there was a conscious effort by council to allow them to do a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, whereas a multifamily, there may be more common space other areas that you know, a typical single family may not be able to accommodate. So the ratio are treated the same for them as commercial and any other developments, the primary reason. So as we're going forward, we're looking at how to re-examine the G policy and how to be more fair. But it, once again, in planning, it's a very hard position because the general plan is encouraging us to build denser, encouraging us to make use of the core spaces, and to really limit our development on the edges. So it really becomes competing interests. So that's why that's one of the policies that's taken the longest is that tree replacement is how do you balance fairness as well as encouraging a canopy while balancing a plethora of different general plan policies that encourages growth. Um, but that's the primary reason. It was the idea that there was a, last, a master plan as part of the overall development and the, some assumptions were made that they may have more room. However, it's kind of a double-edged sword. If we uh, encourage them to not plant it on site, you also lose the in luthies that gives us opportunity to plant it in maybe more appropriate locations and better trees. Um, so there is that fine balance as well. Yeah, I understand that. But for a multifamily development that's an existing development that's years old that has an HOA, they're not going to pay the in lieu fee and they're not going to be able to have space necessarily to plant multiple trees to replace a tree. So I'm just, I'm talking about maybe a specific use case, not necessarily for a new development. Clearly a new development, you'd, we want to follow these, these um, rules because the developer has to you know, pay the in lieu fees and make sure we get an extra trees. But I'm talking about you know, a long time existing multifamily property that has an HOA that, that manages the property. They, um, you know, they've told us, well, we can't, we can't upgrade our trees or make any changes because of this policy. So I just want to flag that and maybe think about how we treat different kinds of properties um, so that we encourage doing the right thing. You know, we also are trying to just upgrade species and make them more locally appropriate. And they know that some of them will say, wait, we'd like to take out this kind of tree and put a different one, but we can't. I guess that's the, I just want to make sure that that's flagged. All right, thank you. Any other, oh, Council Member Foley. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It, it doesn't feel that it was just a year ago that we talked about this. It feels like it's been a lot longer than that, but I'm, I'm certainly impressed with the progress you're making on planting trees in our city, and, and it is all because of Council Member Cohen and his initiative and his <laughs> challenge, really, 10,000 trees. Um, but I, I have a question. I have a question for you regarding the replacement of trees on residential properties. You mentioned something about uh, if the tree is dead, that they use an administrative process that is different than if they're removing a tree that hasn't died. T tell me the distinction and how are they to, how are you monitoring that the tree is getting replaced? So that's probably one of the big area we had, right, was analyzing in trees as well as is it really dead right where staff was missing in a little inconsistency so um, if a tree is dead usually photographic proof of the tree that it's not a tree that just loses leaves during the winter and they think that it's dead then we do allow them to go through an administrative process it's a cheaper permit and usually a, a much easier ratio uh, one to one typically these are single family right, right. Um, and then for uh, trees that do not qualify under that or are unsuitable, unsuitable are certain tree species, but those are specifically single family home, they have to go through a live tree removal uh, process. The idea is we don't want people just to remove a tree because, oh, I just want to use my back patio. When you can look at an entire neighborhood where there's a bunch of oak trees or other big trees that kind of provide a lot of canopy, a lot of benefit to the city overall, they have to go through a live tree removal process where they have to meet certain findings. The tree is in deteriorating health. There's no way of preserving the trees. There's no way of mitigating it. The tree is um, diseased in a certain kind of way. 
or I am going to add an addition to the house and there's no other way of building around it other than the removal of the tree, it gives us a public hearing process where it is transparent to the public on why the tree is being proposed to remove. Um, in general, it's noticed to the neighborhood and is approved that way. However, if anybody in the surrounding neighborhood objects to that or has some questions, they can ask for a hearing. Uh, that process was updated about four or five years ago. Whereas before, every single project that was a live tree had to go to a public hearing. Okay, but a dead tree, uh, uh, it gets removed. Mm -hmm. Do we require the property owner to replace it with the tree? Yes. How do we make sure that happens? So whereas the hard part before was we was an honor system. Please email the project manager and we will see the picture and verify. However, with turnover and time happens, emails get lost in the shuffle, it was really hard to keep track of that. So what we've done now is our permitting system is mark those that would say that if it's not shown verification, which is either submitted online or emailed directly to the project manager, there will be a mark on that property that says, hey, we're coming back to you and saying, where is this tree? Has it been planted or not? Um, so that when the permit expires, we verify either they didn't cut down a tree because they changed their mind or a tree has been planted. And how long from, how long do we allow that process to go on before we drive by the property and see that a tree hasn't been replanted and a uh, citation is issued? So in general, the tree permits are valid for one or two years and they're supposed to replant a tree within three months of the removal. However, okay. there are other cases for bigger sites where they need to remove it because they have to do grading work or other aspects, which may take a little longer. So yeah. the conditions are uh, varying depending on the type of project. Okay, thank you. All right, Council Member Candelas. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just wanted to thank staff for their presentation and the report. Um, I think all of us here on the dais uh, this afternoon, and more broadly the Council, can all agree on the, the intentionality needed to expand our tree canopy coverage across our city, and that takes time, <laughs> obviously, and, and that, that intentionality will ultimately get us to a better place um, if we're doing it now. Um, and, and my next point is, you know, basically counting on my office and, and, and um, with regards to the community education and outreach piece, which, which I heard is, is, a, is an area of improvement uh, that, that's needed, and, and again, with that intentionality, count on my office to, to help with that. Uh, especially with regards to finding appropriate locations to uh, to tree plant, uh, given the the um, in lieu fee um, uh, expenditures not occurring in a timely fashion. So thank you. With that, I'll move the report. Second. No, we didn't have a motion. Thank you. Yep. No. Perfect. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Let's vote. Okay, the report's been accepted by a vote of 5-0. So now, uh, John, you're gonna stick around for the uh, San Jose Transportation Planning Report. Thank you, I'm here again, John Russo, Director of Transportation. We have uh, our um, folks coming up, Ram Dismadu, uh, Division Manager, Department of Transportation. We've got John Sagamini, he's a Senior Transportation Planner at Valley Transportation Authority, and we're gonna talk about the countywide transportation plan, Valley Transportation Plan, so I think Ram just is gonna tee it up and then John will take it away. Thanks, John. Uh, afternoon uh, committee, uh, Ram Sismadu, Division Manager of Planning Policy and Sustainability in DOT. Um, we typically have uh, this uh, agenda item uh, twice a year. We're moving it to once a year on uh, the new work plan. Um, uh, and what we do is we bring various transportation planning items uh, to you, uh, whatever's kind of hot and active um, as we're coming up with the agenda. Um, right now we have a very important uh, transportation piece coming in, right, which is the Valley Transportation Plan update. I mean, for those of you um, who have paid attention to transportation um, in the South Bay, uh, this report uh, sets the groundwork uh, for where major investments are going to go um, uh, over the next coming years. Um, that can mean the next two years or it can mean in the next 10 years. Um, but this is the kind of the, the place where a lot of large projects start. Um, and it's really important for us all to uh, really have a good a handle on what's in there, how it works, and all of that. John uh, Sagamini here from VTA um, is managing that for VTA and is gonna dive in um, and give us some context and details around that. Thank you, go for it, John. Thanks, thanks for having me today. Um, so you got my presentation up. Okay, so um, as you know, Ramsey's and John kind of both explained, I'm, I'm John Sagamini. 
uh, Senior Transportation Planner at BTA. I'm managing the update to our Long Range Transportation Plan, BTP 2050. Um, and really what it is, it's the Long Range Vision for Transportation within Santa Clara County. This is kind of our plan for our county, our vision. It looks out to the year 2050. As Ramsey's mentioned, it could contain um, projects, programs, strategies that not only can we, so can we address in the next five years, but beyond that. So we want to kind of set the groundwork for that. The last plan we actually updated was back in 2014. So it's been quite a while since we've updated the Valley Transportation Plan. And uh, a lot of things have happened. Uh, MTC uh, has developed the Plan Bay Area, which is the long range transportation vision for the nine county Bay Area. So this is a subset of that. And we started this back in late 2022 with some initial outreach and development of goals. And we did that in coordination with uh, the transit vision process known as the Visionary Network for Transit, which uh, we kind of partnered up with. That's gonna serve as the transit vision. So when we think, think of the Valley Transportation Plan, let's kind of think broadly, not just transit, but also other improvements such as you know local streets and roads, complete streets, highway projects, and things like that. So it's a plethora of different things. And so as part of that, we did a lot of outreach right at the beginning. And again, this is only the first stage of outreach. And later on, we'll have kind of a timeline of uh, the uh, activities that will go on as part of the plan update. Um, what we really did was we made ourselves available to the public. And not just the public, but we also talked to community-based organizations. We talked with various VTA internal committees and had uh, breakout sessions and workout gr work, working groups with them. We also outreached to our member agencies. So we did reach out to City of San Jose staff, both in planning and Department of Transportation, uh, to get kind of their initial feedback uh, through this plan process. And this next slide really just kind of summarizes all the uh, input that we took into it. And so where did that input actually go? So in this first stage, uh, as you can see the timeline right up here on your screen, uh, this is gonna be a year and a half long process. And we really completed the initial stage, uh, which was to develop a set of goals for the plan. And so from that, what's gonna happen next, based on those goals, we are gonna work with our member agencies and the public to develop a set of projects. And so those projects not only are contained in our plan, but in the future what will happen is we will submit them to the regional process to the Plan Bay Area update and have a slide on that later on. And that the reason we have um, those projects in there is that it gives it more visibility for discretionary funding. So for example, there are state and federal grants that are gonna be coming up in the next few years. We wanna make sure that projects are actually contained in the plan and we can point to the plan uh, to get some of those projects funded. And then later on, we will also again continue to do our public outreach with our projects, the projects that we develop. We will be taking that to the public. We're also gonna um, work with our board um, as well as our member agencies to look at other strategies that we can implement in the life of the plan. And some of those strategies are really kind of uh, captured in a lot of the city work that uh, the city has done. For example, the downtown area plan. Uh, we have an activity going on right now on the Stevens Creek corridor. We have complete streets projects along uh, the Monterey Road corridor. So we wanna capture all those ideas and, and, and strategies and put them in the plan and, and go from there in developing a project list. And we want our board to adopt this plan in the early part of 2024. So we have some time to work on it. And the biggest kind of piece of this is to determine what those uh, projects are for the plan. So these are a set of goals. And again, the goals were based on discussions that we had with the public uh, that we engage with city staff. And we've shared that with our committees and our board. And these six goals up here are reflective of uh, what we heard from our public outreach phase. And what we hope to do with these six goals is to uh, apply them to uh, determine what projects move forward in the plan. Um, so as you can see there, really wanna focus on uh, making our transit system faster. Um, one of the things that the city of San Jose did um, was approve a transit first policy, which is something that uh, I think is the only city in the county that has done that. So we wanna look at strategies such as that. 
to help uh, increase kind of the frequency of our transit system. We want to look at prioritizing active transportation. So we want to get away our focus from uh, driving. However, we have to realize that there are going to be road projects and street projects. But we want to also make sure that we do initiatives that include things related to complete streets. We want to make biking and walking just as uh, valuable and powerful as uh, driving a car. We want to encourage land uses uh, to orient around our transit and to have complete communities. The city of San Jose, through your general plan, you know, you all have urban village plans. And that kind of speaks to that, that you are looking at um, orienting your land uses around transit. You want to make sure that transit is kind of the, what takes place in, in those communities. We're also working on a climate action and adaptation plan for VTA. Uh, we want to address the climate emergency by reducing transportation emissions, and that's really looking at ways uh, we can get more people on the transit or get more people biking and walking and away from cars. Um, we also want to do things that support equity in transportation, and really the, a lot of this focus was on racial equity and looking at communities that are being underserved and finding out better ways to serve the community. One of the ways that we're doing that is we're currently undertaking a community-based transportation plan process. And we've worked in partnership with the city of San Jose to look at the Monterey Road corridor and looking at ways to improve access for that community. Um, there's a transit lane pro project currently underway uh, in that corridor between Alma and Blossom Hill. And we want to um, look at ways to improve movement for that community, whether it's crossing the street, uh, being able to ride a bike safely, uh, or, or whether it's just um, uh, being safe around our bus stops. And then we also want to do things to pursue safe and reliable travel on highways and expressways. There are a number of highway projects that we have in our long-range plan that also benefit our cities here. Uh, we are, there's a quite a few projects uh, in the city of San Jose that we look at improving uh, efficiency at the interchanges and making it safer to, uh, for people on that. So really quickly, we're in this phase right now uh, to develop a, a list of projects. And so, you know, kind of where do these projects come from? It really comes from our member agency staff. So that really comes from um, the city through various planning efforts that the city has undertaken. Uh, there's projects that we included in the last plan, including uh, the um, People Mover Project, the Airport People Mover Project, that's, that's been in the um, plan the last time, so we want to continue looking at projects like that, working on things around uh, Stevens Creek and other projects that, are, you know, that we've already captured. Um, we're also based on uh, the project list development. We will be doing, again, more public outreach. We want to share the list of ideas that we have from our agencies and get feedback from the public on them, too. And again, that's what's just going to happen is that's going to get approved by our board. And why is that important is really kind of the next slide here. And it really fits into the Plan Bay Area 2050 plus update. So we purposely set up our schedule to align with Plan Bay Area. The last plan was adopted in 2021. The next plan is actually going to get kicked off in summer of this year, in the next couple months. And so we've kind of timed it where now we're at the stage of looking at projects to be included in the plan. And actually, one of the first steps of the plan Bay Area process is to look at projects that are currently in the plan and add more projects moving forward. And that planning process is anticipated to be completed in the fall of 2025. So this actually kind of puts our plan in kind of a, a good timeline to kind of align with this effort that's coming up. And so the plan Bay Area is actually looking at the nine county Bay Area. So it's not just our county. We're going to be competing with the other counties on projects and programs that um, we would hope to get funded. And, and like I mentioned in the last plan, we did have the airport people mover. We've had the Stevens Creek project. There's a couple projects on US 101, Zanker, Skyport, First Street, Fourth Street that we're looking at implementing. Um, and we also are going to be adding new projects. So there will be projects along the Monterey Corridor and, and other corridors, complete streets. And I think we're going to add something on Bascom. So there's going to be quite a few things that we will add to this next update. And so because of that tie-in to Plan B area, we're doing this project solicitation in three phases. 
Uh, we've already initiated discussion with city staff on some of the projects that are currently in the plan B area right now. So we're working on cost updates for those projects. And a lot of those projects are actually really expensive projects. They're $250 million and above. So those are the things that we're working with city staff on right now to get project cost updates to MTC. By the fall, we will be um, doing a call for projects that look at additional projects that we want to add to the plan. So some of the other projects city staff is working on, we want to make sure we include that as part of the effort. And then this whole project list will actually be finalized in the spring of 2024. So again, this is going to be almost a year-long process where we develop a set of improvements for our county that we submit to be included as part of the uh, plan barrier process. And so throughout the process, we will work with project sponsors uh, to make sure we get the, the projects in uh, plan barrier. And so we're right, as I mentioned right now, we're working on cost updates with our member agencies. Um, we will be working again closely with city staff to determine new projects for the plan. Uh, do more public outreach and finalizing kind of the list for uh, submittal to the plan and once we get those projects submitted we can then kind of concentrate on looking at how these projects how we can strategize those projects to influence the plan in the next you know uh, next you know 20 30 years but uh, i also want to note that this is not the only time we update the plan we're going to be on a schedule after this cycle to update it every five years. So once the plan gets adopted in 2024, likely a year after that, we'll begin this process again to kind of revisit uh, this effort and uh, look forward into the future. And I think that kind of wraps up my presentation to see if there's any question from uh, city council staff. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let's start with public comment. We have one speaker card, Blair Beekman. Please make your way down. You will have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, first, a thank you to the VTA that they're reporting they have a budget surplus for next year. It's a lot of relief for all of us, and especially with, with what uh, Muni and BART are going through. Uh, we're in a surplus situation. That's pretty remarkable. Thank you. Um, for this item, Blair Beekman, if I did not say my name already. Um, yeah, just uh, a thank you for it. Uh, it sounds of interest. Um, I'm really interested, as you probably well know, <laughs> how we can talk about a future of open and accountability practices with, there's gonna be a lot of technology involved in all of this planning and concepts of public safety um, that I, I really try to make clear that, that openness and accountability with tech and public safety, there's a future where they really can work hand in hand. And then I think those are the ideas of community harmony that we're really trying to work towards with Vision Zero things, that um, when you work with accountability and openness, you just, you invite a better sense of community for the process, for all of these things you're talking about. So, you know, a few years ago, you couldn't fully talk about equity in, in conversation sometimes, although we like the subject matter, but it's become fairly regular. We talk about equity with our issues. It's my same hope that we can talk about civil protections, civil rights, openness and accountability practices with tech as a major way to uh, understand what tech or what uh, projects we actually need and, and how it actually can function well in a community. And when we marry those two subjects together, I think we'll, we'll be working in a much more interesting future that I hope you want to uh, better talk about <laughs> and more talk about uh, in our future, this sort of planning. Thank you. Back to the committee. All right, are there any questions from the rest of the committee? Yeah, I, I have a couple questions. Um, there's, been a, there's been talk from MTC about um, per mile tolling on freeways. Has, that, has VTA looked into how that might affect transportation in the area and, and surface streets and all the, everything around it? Yeah, we're actually working closely with MTC on their um, their look at uh, express lanes and, and, and future per mile tolling service. I think that process is still kind of ongoing. They just kind of completed their uh, initial public outreach of that. 
Um, they're kind of working on, um, oh. at this moment, they're actually working on some strategies based on that, that uh, the public outreach that they got. And they're going to be sharing that with the, um, the, the working group. I don't have the details of that right now. I think that's probably coming in the next couple of weeks or so. But that, that will be, you know, part of the discussion when we move the, you know, our, 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 our plan forward. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then just a quick question for, I think maybe for Ramses or John. Um, the, the report talked about solicitation from cities about major projects. Is there going to be a process where you're talking to the council about what we're putting on our list and how we're prioritizing projects across the city? A absolutely. Um, so first, we've already been having discussions with all of your offices, right? Um, and our uh, multimodal transportation improvement plans are, are supposed to be the expression of those, um, or other planning actions. So, for example, in your district, the the, the grade separation of the North First Street light rail um, project um, is in there, and is something that we're we're pushing to to get prioritized that much more, so the initial planning can get happen start happening, particularly in that um, um, uh, right across the expressways there. Um, so absolutely, we'll make sure we're coming to you um, talking about um, what projects we think should be there, um, as well as, as if you guys have ideas um, uh, on top of what we already have. And this is different than highway interchange projects. That's a separate process than this process, or is that all combined into one? Yeah, it's all going to be combined. Uh, so it's going to be not just, it's all of transportation. So okay. um, not just um, um, transit projects, but definitely other highway projects. In fact, we've already, last week, I think we talked to DOT already about some of the uh, major ones that have been included in our Measure B uh, program, uh, some of those interchange improvements as part of the list. And some of the new things like the Montague uh, 880, which we now know we want to try to prioritize as well. Yeah, the county has also talked to us about that. So. Yeah, all right, good. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they'll keep their eyes on that one too. All right, any other questions from the, okay, is there a motion to accept the report? So moved. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Let's vote. All right, motion carries 5-0. Thank you so much for the report. Brings us to item four, our city initiatives roadmap, resilient and sustainable city infrastructure and emergency preparedness. And if we could hear uh, four and five together with this presentation, oh, okay. and then uh, you can act sep separately on them if that's okay. Act separately on the two, but one report. Okay, one so report. we'll be hearing four and five, but take, we'll discuss each separately with comments separately on the two, and then vote independently on those two. Okay, so. Uh, thank Kip. you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager, I will start the presentation, and then I'll be joined by Erica Garafo and uh, many of the members of the team. We'll walk you through both the quarterly update and the new city infrastructure strategy. So our first slide. As we know, a great city has great infrastructure. We also know that our infrastructure faces four challenges. The need to rehabilitate an aging infrastructure, the need to meet the needs of a growing population, and the need to mitigate climate change while also becoming more resilient and adaptable to that climate change. So following the March budget message direction from Mayor and City Council, we are coming to you today with an infrastructure strategy that addresses those challenges and also includes much of the ongoing work that was part of the enterprise priority. So as a little bit of background, as we've talked about in the strategy addresses in more detail, a colleague at San Jose State actually put it very well recently. He said, climate change is humanity's final exam for our course on collective action problem solving at a global scale. In this chart here, you can see the correlation between increased emissions and increased temperature change. Again, correlation is not necessarily causality, but we have a great deal of scientific evidence and consensus around the fact that in this case it actually is. Another framing piece as we look at the work from uh, Kate Raworth, um, and we'll just move to the full slide on this. It doesn't look like, there we go. She has the uh, premise that we are both simultaneously overshooting the capacity of the planet and have shortfalls on the necessity of the people. And so we have to solve both of those problems simultaneously because we love the planet and we love the people that are in them. And this gives us this narrow donut of a space that we have to create the safe, just space for humanity, in her words. In order to do all of this, we need to shift our thinking. 
We have to change our mindsets from departmental to systems thinking, from short term to longer term, from past as prologue to modeling likely futures, and expanding beyond merely sustainability to full adaptation, as well as finding bold and innovative approaches to funding what will be a very expensive piece of work. There's a lot to do, so we have to focus. In addition to the needs of the planet and the people, we ask two key questions. What is core for us as a city of San Jose and what is potentially transformative if done at scale or at least has a significant return on investment in terms of the work that we do. That brings us to our existing enterprise priority and I'm gonna hand it over to Eric Garafo, our lead resilience strategist, to talk you through that, um, where we are on it, and then we'll return to its evolution into the city infrastructure strategy. <clears throat> Good afternoon, um, Erica Garofo, Lead Resilient Strategist. Uh, so as Kit mentioned, before we jump into the forthcoming uh, city infrastructure strategy, just wanted to remind you of where we left off with the sustainable and resilient city infrastructure and emergency preparedness enterprise priority. Um, so as a reminder, the work of this enterprise priority aligns projects across environmental services, public works, community energy, transportation, information technology, planning, building, and code enforcement departments, as well as the city manager's offices of emergency management and intergovernmental relations. Um, so the enterprise priority is organized under five objectives. You can see here across the top, disaster ready and climate smart, infrastructure resilience, clean energy resilience, water resilience, and natural environment restoration. These five objectives are supported by 18 work streams that comprise the highest priority initiatives. And we have been returning to this committee on a quarterly basis to report out on key results in each of these uh, work streams um, and also to share some of the highlights from the work. So with that in mind, um, apologize for the very, very tiny font. Um, I do like to get it on one screen, but uh, I might recommend coming back to this as a PDF later. Um, so as a reminder, uh, we, um, ask, we, we ask each workstream driver um, to commit to one or more deliverables that they plan on accomplishing in each workstream each quarter. Um, we call these key results. And at the end of the quarter, we score ourselves um, on whether or not we accomplished what we said we would. So green means we got it all done, yellow means we got most of it accomplished, and red means we missed the mark. So, um, as you can see up on the slide here, um, we are showing the key results for quarter three of this year. That's January through March 2023. Overall, five of our work streams completed their commitments in full. Seven work streams completed more than 60%, and another three work streams completed less than 60% of their proposed key results. Um, it was a very busy quarter as departments were uh, putting together budget proposals, which we'll dig into on a subsequent slide. Um, but I wanted to highlight a couple of our green key results um, on this next slide. So um, I wanna highlight deliverables from two work streams, seek new state federal funding and policy and understanding sea level rise, because they have been working together. So first, um, our intergovernmental relations team worked with Valley Water to lobby Congress and in include $91.2 million in the National Defense Authorization Act, um, which uh, went through in February of this year. That additional sum will be used for the Shoreline Levy Project, helping to ensure that the full project will be completed, which in turn leads to the second work stream, understanding sea level rise. Uh, because of the work by the Intergovernmental Relations Team and subsequent infusion of resources, we were then able to restart the conversation with Valley Water and the State Coastal Conservancy on the design of the final two levee reaches or segments. Um, so just to put this in perspective, when the shoreline levee is completed, we will have protected the regional wastewater facility, the community of El Viso, and much of North San Jose from sea level rise. It is difficult to understate just how existential the need for protection against sea level rise is for San Jose. And the work of these teams have helped us in a significant and meaningful way. So I'll turn it back to Kip uh, to walk us through the next segment of the presentation. Okay, so we're gonna take it from this enterprise priority and we're gonna evolve it into this city infrastructure strategy. There are about eight changes here. This will not be on the quiz and I'll do this fairly quickly, but if we have questions, we can always come back. 
So um, of the eight changes, the first one is we're pulling out three work streams, not because they're not important, but because they are fully mature and have ongoing ways of reporting to council independent of this strategy. So we're gonna pull out uh, the Measure T projects, which regularly come back to council, the rebuilding of the regional wastewater facility, which goes through the treatment plant advisory committee as well as council, and then ensure cybersecurity, which is primarily best addressed in closed session. Um, and we will also be focusing down the uh, addressing infrastructure backlog O&M more narrowly on a range of sewer, uh, sanitary, storm sewer items, which are both highly critical and we believe we have the opportunity to address with potential new funding rather than trying to address the entire infrastructure backlog at least over the next 12 to 18 months. The next set of changes come in fast and furious as we will be adding uh, a new work stream of municipal regional permit for stormwater. As you've heard, this five-year permit has a number of new requirements which are extremely significant and at this point essentially unfunded. Uh, next addition or change is the merging of the work of the sanitary and storm sewer collection and green stormwater infrastructure into a single uh, uh, piece of work to take those systems and take a more utility-based approach to managing them. Then we are merging some of the work streams related to uh, municipal electrical microgrids and downtown electrification into this one on municipal microgrids and electrical service. And we are revising the work streams or the names of the work streams such as the sea level rise. We're including the shoreline levy work to re appropriately reflect, reflect the needed build out and we are explicitly adding the city's fleet to our work on electrification for charging infrastructure. Uh, finally, we're clarifying the water supply work is focused broadly on water supply, and uh, we are adding an entire new objective around transportation and aviation with both the airport terminal, the BART to Silicon Valley extension, vehicle blight, and the Dearden Station area and airport connector to fully bring all of the work that comes before this committee into this uh, strategy uh, in a single place. So with that as a very quick fly through, um, you see then our recommended infrastructure strategy before you. We now have five objectives, they're slightly different than before, and 16 work streams, but we've added in the entire focus around transportation and aviation. These are all then the most important change initiatives that we see needing to focus on over the next 12, 18 months to two to three years. And they rest on top of the numerous day-to-day -day work of core services, as well as departmental changes that individual departments are overseeing. In addition to these work streams, we have uh, and three guiding principles that we've identified for this strategy. One is addressing inequity. Second is identifying new funding, which goes from being a work stream to being an underlying guiding principle. And three is building the team to deliver as we need to scale the size of the organization, uh, especially clean energy and deal with significant transitions in environmental services and in the public works departments. The one I wanna to touch on in a little more detail is addressing inequity. We feel that very strongly that the historical investments in infrastructure have often been deeply inequitable and we have a role in addressing them in the work that we do. We think that you will see this in two primary ways. One is by making sure that the new investments that we guide take in equity into consideration so that all people have adequate access to the infrastructure and services that they need and have paid for. An example of this was given earlier with the tree canopy work that uh, Rick Scott and the team dis discussed. The second is given the enormous investments in infrastructure, it is completely appropriate that we ensure that these investments also become a pathway for pros to prosperity. That people who are able to take advantage of the construction jobs, the jobs designing these, the jobs planning these, are people from our communities and communities in need that have been impacted or disinvested in historically and that we make sure that this, these significant investments become again that pathway to prosperity for them. And we will be working to make that a more clear and robust strategy over the course of the year as one of our three guiding principles. So in terms of implementation, let me hand it back to Erica Garafo to walk you through how we are approaching implementation and governance of this city infrastructure strategy. Thank you, Kip. 
Okay, so in terms of our governance structure, um, the approach to governance aligns two city service areas, uh, environmental uh, and utilities and transportation and aviation, and the work plan of the Transportation and Environment Committee with the overall city infrastructure strategy and team. So um, on the left, you see uh, Deputy City Manager Kip Harkness as the primary accountability for the city infrastructure strategy um, uh, and team staffing the Transportation and Environment Committee, um, which it will guide the strategy, um, as well as the city service areas, uh, si sorry, the singular city service area of environment and utility services. And then over on the right side, you see Deputy City Manager Rob Lloyd um, with responsibility for uh, the city service area of transportation and aviation. Um, in addition to the city infrastructure strategy work, uh, these departments are also involved in managing numerous complex core services, department level change initiatives, and many are also part of the new city focus areas. However, when it comes to infrastructure, this strategy and the governance framework is the primary approach guiding change across the entire city organization. Um, oh yes, and we will continue to have quarterly OKRs, which I'll talk about more on the future slide. So as a collective city infrastructure team, uh, we're going to have a, a few different aspects to how we work. First, uh, we will use our interdepartmental monthly city infrastructure meetings uh, to engage in um, debate on approach and strategy, clear roadblocks to progress, and gather feedback for further improvement. Um, in these monthly gatherings, we also monitor progress of our key results, um, ensuring that teams are on track and able to address any challenges or obstacles. Second, we'll have uh, Workstream deep dive sessions. Um, these are scheduled on an as-needed basis um, in which we explore significant changes in the work streams. We develop new approaches or engage in more in-depth problem solving. Um, uh, let's see, uh, third, um, we have been taking regular field trips to some of our city infrastructure. Um, in fact, the uh, picture that you can kind of see in the background there um, is of a recent visit to a large trash capture device. Um, so these have been really, um, really fun ways to both actually see city infrastructure in process, um, as well as get to meet folks from across the city. Um, we invite uh, departments who aren't working in those particular areas to come and, and see what each other is up to. Um, and then lastly, um, we'll hold a series of what we're calling thought partner conversations. Um, uh, and we envision uh, that we'll have these uh, sprinkled throughout the year. Um, we had our first one back in April. Um, and uh, at that gathering, we had folks from Save the Bay, Spur, Green Foothills, Coastal Conservancy, Valley Water, Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful, Silicon Valley Leadership Group, San Jose Conservation Corps, um, as well as the Stanford Dewar School of Sustainability um, and a handful of city departments. Uh, so turning now to the budget, um, while we don't yet have an adopted budget, the city is proposing to make uh, meaningful investments across eight of our 16 work streams. In total, we anticipate adding or continuing 26 positions and allocating approximately $14 million in the coming fiscal year. This $14 million includes both funding for positions as well as one-time money to support the work streams. So here is the full slate of objectives and work streams um, as Kip laid out. Um, and on a quarterly basis, the team will report on notable achievements, challenges, and learnings to this committee. Throughout the coming year, we will use this committee as a forum to seek direction on policy and strategic approach and provide updates on the individual work streams at critical junctures. We are currently revising the committee work plan to focus more primarily on the city infrastructure strategy and the related work streams. Um, and of course, my favorite, uh, quarterly OKRs. Uh, so we'll continue to use objectives as measured by key results to drive implementation of the city infrastructure strategy. Um, and we will uh, continue to come back quarterly um, and score ourselves on how we did on the previous quarter's commitments. Um, and now I will turn it back to Kip to finish. 
Thank you, Erica. That at a high level is the city infrastructure strategy. The document itself goes into greater detail on the five objectives and 16 work streams, and also includes additional suggested reading, 10 books and 10 reports for those of you who wanna get the extra points and do the deeper cut. Uh, but for today, the team is here to answer any questions you have about the strategy, and we are open to your feedback and direction. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for the report. Uh, now on to public comment. We have uh, two uh, public speaker cards uh, for Blair Beekman. He submitted two for D4 and D5. So we'll just take both your comments at the same time and so we don't have to have you walk up and down. You will be given four minutes to speak. Thank you. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. Um, a reminder that uh, uh, Department of Transportation, uh, they may actually have more uh, surveillance technology uh, questions and needs and projects and practices than uh, the San Jose Police Department. Just a little factoid for everyone. Um, for this item, um, you know, I, I'm interested how, we, I thank you that you have uh, concepts of infrastructure and emergency preparedness uh, at the same time as uh, the tree planting issues. I feel there's an interesting connection there that you're trying to uh, connect uh, that when we talk about tree planting, you know, it can be good ways to address uh, emergency services and preparedness ideas. I think that's really smart thinking and intelligent and, and fun, enjoyable, uh, uh, co cognitive, comprehensive ways to be uh, practicing and learning as a community process. Thank you immensely. Uh, it makes it more interesting for me uh, to understand. And, and thank you for your patience that you're open to uh, wanting to hear um, my, uh, me try to convey my thoughts in, in, in just adult mature terms. <laughs> what really what to prepare for a real serious uh, emergency preparedness issues. Thank you for your patience and learning, learning how I can talk about these things here at the public space well in decent good terms. Uh, with that all said, um, just, uh, uh, man, there, we really have uh, sea level rise issues uh, that I think, we, uh, my clock says 2.13, how much time do I actually have left? Two minutes left? Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, um, yeah, so my feeling is that uh, with, with sea level rise issues, um, that we have an, is an issue of, uh, it's really serious, and we're learning with federal dollars coming in right now to, to really start to more openly talk about um, sea level rise. Uh, the levy idea sounds really interesting and helpful. I'm really worried about uh, underground water coming up uh, and what that means, uh, how that's, that's going to, it's causing problems now and just good luck in learning how to more openly talk about that. Hopefully the levy will help. I'm su I suppose uh, Bay Area uh, BART tunneling issues can be part of that levy process. Good luck with that. You mentioned on the item that you, you're, you're redeveloping the wastewater management uh, treatment plant. I mean, you guys have just spent the past five years on such things. I, I don't know if that's quite the appropriate language to use for it. Um, you know, you spent a lot of money in the past five years already developing, uh, redeveloping the plant. Uh, it's, it's additional funding that we're talking about, I think, at this point. Um, and I guess that's about it for myself. I think um, I'll stop here and just thank you that you're really trying to talk about uh, disaster preparedness and just good luck how we can always be looking for ways to make it an open conversation and now work to actually uh, mitigate actual potential, any uh, natural disaster uh, things. Thanks. Thank you, back to the committee. You said you had one more speaker? He, had, he submitted two for D4 and oh. D5. Oh, okay, I yes. thought there was a second, okay. No, that's fine. same person. Thank you. Um, all right, Council Member Ortiz. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the City Manager's Office and, of course, all the staff who've been putting together the documents, the um, presentation, and, and uh, support of the goals that have been outlined. Um, I want to, first off, really excited for a lot of the work. Updating infrastructure is always important uh, for our constituents. 
But I did want to take this opportunity to talk a little, about, a little bit about the soft story um, uh, uh, planned uh, updates. I know there's some confusion and fear in some areas of the community um, that these planned ret retrofits may result in some displacement. Um, so I just thought if we could start talking about that now in anticipation for that, if there could be a plan put together. Um, I just wanted to hear what, I guess a little bit more in details in regards to when these retrofits do happen, what sort of protections would tenants have? Is there any sort of obligation on the property owner to, to like pay for a hotel for the, what, what, what would the process look like, I guess? At, <clears throat> excuse me, Ray Reardon, Director of the Office of Emergency Management. Thank you for the question. Regarding the soft story project, we're spending the, the summer getting a lot of feedback from the community on what the project looks like, what, what the impacts will be, where, what the costs would be, how the engagement, and that will be both for the landlord and the, the, the tenants, so we mm -hmm. make sure we get an equal uh, feedback from the, the groups involved. At this time, there's no, there's no uh, planned uh, vision that people will be displaced while the retrofit's going in. Most of the operation retrofitting can be done in the open space that is causing the, the soft story structure. And that's what we're working on now is the designs that would af affect those structures that are identified as part of this process. So we'll be collecting the information for both the ordinance, and the process, and the feedback from the public, as well as financial uh, programs that can be available for part of the process. Thank you. Do we, do we know what the communications or outreach plan will look like for this? It's coming together right now. I don't have it together right. right now, but we do as a city have contracts with community engagement professionals who we will be engaging mm -hmm. now to put that program in, uh, together uh, through the summer. And there'll be two pieces of it. One is the work that we're doing in, as we bring the policy to you for your consideration and decisions. And then after that, we expect that uh, should you approve it, you'll direct us to do a, a further engagement uh, program. So we'll bring together uh, we'll do that right now, the pre-work as, as has been described, but when we come back to you in the August fall timeframe, uh, we will also have a proposal for outreach at that point, which you can provide further direction and comment on. Uh, but I think the bottom line key is that for these types of retrofits, for the vast majority, it shouldn't be any displacement at all. Most of that work can be done. It might displace some parked cars, uh, but most of that work can be done on the on the story that is the soft story without having to go in as invasively as, say, uh, unreinforced masonry, where you usually have to bring everybody out of the building and completely redo the building. Okay. Um, and then in regards to the actual funding for the infrastructure updates, these are all being all being funded by property owners? Uh, right now we're working with the Federal Emergency Management Agency, better known as FEMA. Okay. Right now we have a grant to do both the ordinance design work, uh, the second phase, which will kick in uh, immediately after the phase one is done, which is the ordinance. There is funding to establish programs for helping assist with the funding of the retrofit. We're also applying for additional mm -hmm. FEMA grants, which are the hazard mitigation grants that come out after disasters occurred, like the floods. Mm -hmm. So we applied in that process for additional funds. However, we expect that there to be a significant gap between the funds available and the funds needed. So the vast majority of these investments would have to be done by the private property owners themselves. And, and depending on the circumstance, would either be passed through to the tenant or passed through over time, depending on what the, uh, what the ordinances are. Yeah, and, and that was going to be my next concern, because when I think about where these soft story structures are in my district, it's Mayfair, it's some, it's all like affordable housing, lower income, working class neighborhoods, um, which is a concern, because if this cost is pushed back onto the tenants, that could also be another way for uh, some sort of displacement. If, if for, for our affordable housing, would we, could we just expect that they would raise the rent? Would they just say, you know, this is uh, maintenance that was required to update, you know, the facility and therefore you have to pay for it. What, what could we, how do we prepare our tenants for this? Yeah, this is all very good questions. A lot of it depends on the status of the, of the property, whether it's under our rental control ordinance pre-1979 or not. There's sort of different answers for each. We as a team have been discussing this and I, I would really, two things if you would, I'd love to come and give a chance to brief you in more depth yeah, on this, and there. also love to bring this conversation back to the full council uh, uh, as part of the ordinance piece. These are all very good questions. I, as, a, uh, as a part of the rationale for this, which I know you know, is that 
we are very concerned about the harm to exactly those residents, and we want neither to harm them in a disaster nor harm them by <laughs> preventing the disaster. So that's what we're trying to balance here. Exactly. I don't want to be like, oh, we want to make sure you're safe, so move to Modesto. And we're exactly. We're going to put somebody in here who's going to pay more rent. And you know, I'm, I'm moving right now, and every single apartment's like 3000 plus for, for rent, even in neighborhoods that are like gang impacted and crime impacted. So we, we completely agree. Spread thin. Okay, well, um, I guess I've exacerbated it uh, enough, but love to talk to you about that later. Thank you. All right, I'll entertain a motion on both items together. We need to cross-reference. The motion should include cross-referencing item five to the full city council. All right, so we have a motion to approve items four and five and cross-reference item five to the council. Let's vote. All right, that motion carries 5-0. And now we're on to open forum. We have one speaker card. Blair Beekman, please make your way down. You have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Hi, Blair Beekman today. Uh, Blair Beekman, thanks for the meeting today. Uh, uh, I think it was a really varied, interesting uh, set of uh, items you had. Thank you. Um, I wanted to comment on two important items that are coming up in this budget time. First, a thank you that uh, you can haggle with budget issues and invite the community to haggle along as well in, in really deciding good plans for current budget issues uh, with measure e issues and arpa issues uh, I'm, I'm interested uh thank you that with arpa funding that you actually had a community meeting process for it to really ask that um i think we can do so much better than just you know stuffing and remaining money into police funds for now and um I really hope that there is community engagement involved in looking for different choices, like say the fire department or the housing department, that I don't think would, if there is any skim off the top from that sort of money, man, I, we feel so much better about ourselves at going to those places instead of the police department. And just the investment portfolio of the fire department and the housing department is just so much more decent than the police department. I know you have an easy ride with the police department, but it's just the police department is based on war. And it's really depressing to think that you guys are going to invest in that sort of thing when we're trying to talk about reimagine. I mean, really, I mean, there's there's ideas of living wage issues that people work on a lot. I hope you can work on that. And with Measure E funding, um, I really hope we can stick to the original 7525 model that there seems to be, can be ways we can do that and, and, and satisfy all sides. Good luck in those efforts to work towards that sort of goal that I think is really important and, and not to be feared. Thank you. Thank you, back to the committee. All right, thank you. Our meeting's adjourned at 3.13 p.m.